Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect Pacific Northwest authors with new listeners and provide advice for inspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. So hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the Authors of the Pacific Northwest podcast. And today I have a fabulous and inspiring author, Dee Graham. So Dee, you want to say, I'm sorry, it's Deanna and I say Dee, I shortened it. (laughs) Deanna, you want to say hi to everyone? (laughs) Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So Dee, Deanna, is it okay if I shorten you and say Dee? Because I talked to a couple of other students during the day that I say Dee, so I'll slip into that. That's fine. Okay. So what state in the Pacific Northwest do you live in? I live in Washington State and I live in Skagit County. Okay, awesome. The beautiful Pacific Northwest. We're going to be coming into some hot weather soon. We are. <laughs> That's <what> I heard. <laughs> and so besides being an author, I always like to ask um, my other authors that come on the podcast, do you have a day job? And if so, what is it? I do have a day job. My husband and I own a business called CDR's Yard. So we have an industrial salvage yard. And that keeps us really busy. I'm also a mother and my daughter actually just graduated from high school and I have a 14 year old son. And then recently within the last year, I've been working on becoming a life coach for people with have with alopecia. And so that's kind of more recently what I do. Oh, so great. Oh, awesome. okay. So there's a couple things I got to ask. So the salvage yard, it's like you salvage cars and then you resell like chrome and bumpers and things like that, right? No, what we do is we have industrial salvage. Oh, industrial. So, okay. Mm-hmm. So it might be, you know, a bulldozer or it yeah. might be restaurant equipment or Ooh, super just, cool. yeah, it just kind of depends on what we get and what we find. And it, it's fun and it is a lot of work. So Oh, yeah, I bet. It's really cool. So the reason why I ask is my husband has an old truck. And so I've been to plenty old salvage yards looking for chrome pieces. For mm-hmm. I bet. <laughs> it's like hunting and gathering. It's, it's a lot of fun. Totally. So cool. Okay. And then you're starting the kind of the topic for my listeners. So you guys, the listeners know this, I'm deviating just a little bit from um, some of the creative authors that we do because Deanna's story is fantastic, but you're doing the life coaching and you're starting that. So walk us through just a teeny bit about what life coaching is all about for those that don't know. Sure. Well, life coaching meets people where they are in wherever journey they are. Sometimes you have people who want to organize their lives or or get ready for a big move. And so you might have someone who is a life coach to help someone figure out where they are and what they can accomplish with where they are in their life and not having the goals that we want them to have, but but reaching goals that they want to do. And, and so there's kind of a process that you go through. And so for me, I do that with people with alopecia and okay. they so they come to me and they say I want to help moving forward with this then we work together to figure those things out okay awesome well that brings into the subject of why you're such a unique author to me and you're in the northwest besides that but the your your working and your work is really based around and I'll probably say it wrong alopecia did I say it right <laughs> Al- alopecia alopecia so give our listeners that don't know what that is kind of a background and understanding what what it is that you're working with and what why people sure. come to you for it. Okay. So alopecia is an autoimmune disease and we call it, we prefer to call it a condition versus a disease where your hair, basically your body is allergic to your hair and your hair follicles respond by saying, okay, I'm done with you. I'm sick. Let's get rid of you. And um, it could result in just a small spot that might grow back or complete, it can be complete scalp loss. Mm-hmm. And it could also turn into um, alopecia universalis, which is head to toe hair loss. Mm-hmm. There's three different variations of that. And 147 million people in the world are living with this or will experience this in their lifetime. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason why I gravitate towards you is because I have experienced this myself. So I'm revealing something to my listeners that when you don't know, maybe my hairdresser and my family only know this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I did experience this at one point and, you know, went to the doctors and they explained the whole thing to me about the autoimmune and, and the issues you know around it. And so now, you know, we're watching it. Mine did grow back. And, but I always wonder, you know, if it's going to come back, all those kinds of things. Mm-hmm, so, sure. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So you personally, do, is it something you're dealing with too? 
Yes. So from the age of seven, I, I lost my hair probably within about three months when I was seven years old. And then I didn't have any hair until about the age of 14 where I had regrowth. And then most of my hair kind of stuck around, but I had bald spots pop up here and there. And then I was constantly trying to chase them and cover them and yeah, my hair just yeah. the right way. You know that. You can oh, yeah. get yeah. that piece of it. Sure. And then I had complete loss again after the birth of my son. Oh, okay. 15 years ago. So. so is it hormonal based? Do they think that, that you know it can be triggered by hormone, or is it there's... certainly? Yeah, certainly there are there's there's a million different triggers. I mean, mm-hmm. just while putting this book together, I, I was finding some incredible ones from you know birth control to just having a slight virus to having surgery, wow. and you know they they do talk about stress being a factor. And, and certainly when we're under stress, it doesn't help with hair loss, but it, it also is not causal. We, it, it's just maybe potentially a trigger. So, And I think that's something that the doctors and I finally concluded for me. I was definitely going through one of the most stressful moments of my life with work. And mm-hmm. I, at that point, made a very conscious decision that if my work experience is making me sick enough that my body reacts like this, mm-hmm. then I got to change it. So it ended up being a positive thing for me because I ended up getting the really great job I have now. Mm-hmm. But in the midst of it all, it was very terrifying and, and you know, mm-hmm. and, and hard to deal. And I had known, did not know anybody at that point that it had experienced this. Then I ended up meeting one of my coworkers who has full, you know, he has it too, and he doesn't have any hair at all. And finally met somebody and had the experience of talking with them about that. Right. Um, and the thing with me that was the most interesting thing to explain to my family members about it was that I knew something was going on because in those areas it started to tingle, like my hair was being pulled mm. really hard, and then it would uh-huh. tingle. And then I started all this hair loss. <laughs> right, right. Then, Whoa, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. So let's get to the point of the fact that now you're also an author too. Mm-hmm. So, so explain, well, first, let me ask the one burning question I ask all my authors for some consistency in my podcast. Yeah. What's one thing that you want your new listeners listening to you now or new readers when they go to read your book to know about you specifically? Well, certainly I want them to know that I'm, I'm credible with what I write and, and what I talk about and how I serve others. That's extremely important to me. And the unique thing about this particular book is that it has 75 different stories in there. So they're, wow. they're touching on different age groups, um, different genders, people from all around the world. And that was really important for me to, to make sure that we were kind of getting a, a global feel for the book and, and, and it was really touching different age groups. And that was really important mm-hmm. for me. So, so you published, well, you created the, you collected all these stories mm-hmm. and then you created a book to so know. So let's talk a little bit about the publishing. Did okay. you self publish? Did you go and pursue traditional publishing? How did that work for you? I did self-publish. I didn't. I, I felt like I'd kind of put the project off as long as I could, or as long as um, time would allow. And it felt like it was important for me to to push it and do it. And, and in order to do that, I had to be self-published. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that seemed the easiest for me, and it and it truly was. It was it was an easy process for me once I got going on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I looked at, I went to the Amazon uh, site, you know, that you have for the book mm-hmm. and you have some beautiful pictures on there. Did you take those pictures? Did you have a photographer um, for the cover? How did that work? Uh, no, actually the photos that are all taken were from professional photographers. And we do have a couple that were really good friends that took photos because we were in a, in a rush. These stories were great and I really wanted to use them. The professional photographers weren't available for a couple stories for us to get those but the photographers were fantastic they they said absolutely you know we are invested in the idea of what we could bring as far as awareness to alopecia and we want to help mm-hmm. that so I was really lucky I had photographers in Malaysia and over in Scotland and Australia and all over the U.S. 
It, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's what I was drawn to. I was also drawn to um, some of the stuff you have on Facebook. So my listeners, if you ha- want to see what we're talking about, I'll have in show notes um, Deanna's um, Facebook page that you can go to also um, her book cover. So you can go to the book and see it and see the cover. It's absolutely beautiful. Very well done. Um, did you have some uh, marketing background help somebody helping you in the area or you know how did I mean, no. you know for it already right you have the people that are are struggling with it but to get it out to others how right what was your thinking about that how did you process that process going through that <laughs> I I will tell you I did not know and that was kind of, it, it's the weakest link for me I will say mm-hmm. as far as marketing I don't I don't have a background in it. I do have friends that are in marketing and they give me some advice. And then of course it's reading up on what, you know, Amazon keywords and things like that. And so that was the big piece of it. I will, I would like to mention too, that my sister, Kristen formatted my book for me. She made it look, she made it look as beautiful as it does. She, and we really had to put our heads together and worked intensely on this project. So I was really happy with that. And she's, one of the reasons why it's here well yay for her and for yeah. sisters right the support groups are so totally. important and i i talk with almost every author on the podcast about it we mostly really trigger in on the idea of um support groups for authors out there for independent authors for self-publishing mm-hmm. um besides you know our families are very very important and, and obviously i would assume you have a very strong support group with your family and friends and relatives um mm-hmm. do you have other support groups that you could share with other other writers, or somebody that's thinking about writing um, a book to help inspire others that are struggling in in an area, particularly. Absolutely. Um, for me, I'm I'm directly involved with the Skagit Valley Writers League here in Skagit okay. County, and they're they're just wonderful. I'm actually on the board, but yeah. we have workshops once a month, and we bring in people that have skills that are within the group and also outside the group that offer us advice on on things that we wouldn't understand as young writers exactly so and and that's super helpful so my advice I suppose would be to get involved in your local writers group especially if you are having trouble getting motivated to write or just feel like everything is overwhelming and and confusing and sometimes that just really puts things into a good space and you're able to move forward that way Yeah, there is something absolutely valuable about sitting down with one or two other writers and say, I'm kind of struggling with this. (laughs) And then Mm -hmm. you get to talk the language where absolutely when you're sharing it, like when I, my husband comes home from work and I'll read something to him, he loves it, you know, and he he almost always loves it. It's very rare he doesn't, you know. (laughs) But it's it's funny because I love to also read or share with other writers um, what I'm working on or be a part of their process too because we'll we'll be able to find those pieces and holes and help each other and it's so valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I wish I lived closer to Skagit Valley. <laughs> it's a great group. Um, so you know, besides what you've gone through personally in your life, what is your inspiration as an author as far as getting this the messages out? and the knowledge out about, I'm going to say it right, alopecia, even though I have it, I can say it wrong. <laughs> I, I suppose my, my inspiration for this is, is the fact that I, I never had anything like this to look at. And that was one of the reasons why I put it together. There was nothing positive out there about being bald and mm-hmm. authentically and they weren't just villains in a movie or a show mm-hmm. and, and that was important for me to say okay these people are living mm-hmm. fantastic lives they're happy they they may or may not have hair right now but they are they're pretty exceptional and I wanted to write about those people and share my own story as well and and the way that it turned out was was really great in my opinion. I really was happy with it. And so as far as inspiration, it was other people who were living Mm -hmm. a fantastic life and I wanted to help them tell their stories. 
Awesome. So we're going to get into the stories here in a little bit, listeners, and we're going to do something a little quite different. I think we're going to have Deanna's going to read quite a few and then she's going to tell her story too. So we're going to get to sit back and really listen to this. But before then, um, Deanna, tell us, is there anything else on the works for you besides this project? Now that you've gotten to the point of where you've published a book and you're probably out there a lot helping people and working, you know, through um, mentoring others and being a life coach, what's on the agenda for you next? As far as writing is concerned, I've been asked several times, a lot actually. I just attended a huge conference for alopecia and people are always asking me, are you going to do a second volume? And I intentionally put volume one on this because I, I knew I wanted to do additional mm-hmm. volumes and I, I could certainly start one right now and be done within six months if I wanted to. But I'm, my feeling is that I want to go in maybe a little bit different direction right now, maybe work on a graphic novel. Oh, fun. Or a children's <laughs> book, yeah. Mm-hmm. So those are things that are kind of out there floating around. That I'm hoping Would it be so. around this topic too, the graphic novel for... for Absolutely. Children? That is so brilliant. That, yeah. And I think that it, children probably would suffer the most with this because it's so... Um, it's just not out there. People don't understand it at all. Right. right. And so that is absolutely brilliant. So I say, yes, do that. (laughs) (laughs) We cheer you on. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So let's set the stage for your readings because I am very interested in hearing these stories. Um, And so I'm going to actually go quiet and let you just share with the listeners, you know, how you're going to set this up. And then at the very end, after your story, I'll close this up. All right. Okay, so I'm going to start off by reading, I probably have four four or five stories, and they're just going to be excerpts of each story to kind of get you interested, so you might want to, of course, purchase the book, but this gives you kind of a little bit of insight into each person's story, but but also a, a broader view of what alopecia is, and right now I'll start off with Lucy's story, and if you see Lucy in the book, she's on page 36, she's She's the sweetest thing. And I've also done two book signings with her, and she is hysterical and so much fun. And when we wrote this, this was about five, four, I should say four years ago. So Lucy was five years at the time. And I'll just start. Lucy, I am five years old. Alopecia? This is just the way my head is. I don't have alopecia. I don't like having alopecia because I want long hair like the other girls. My favorite thing is that I can take a quick bath and my sister, who has tons of hair, takes forever and cries when you brush it. I have seen pictures of other kids with alopecia but never met any yet. I met Becky at Taco Mamacita where she was working and I think she's beautiful. I'm happy when I think about both of us having alopecia. When I grow up, I can't decide if I want to be a horse rider teacher or the person who orders pizza at Pump It Up. And that's that's Lucy's story. And I kind of I guided kids a lot with introductory questions and they turned into kind of their own take on the story. And I really loved how she just said, Alopecia, this is just the way my head is. So that's Lucy's story. And there's a sweet comment from her mom that says, Lucy is a confident, beautiful little angel. She is funny and smart and enjoys being the class clown in school. When other kids ask why she doesn't have hair, Lucy responds, it's how God made me. Right. That's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, and it's those fun, sweet stories that I really just, I really loved. And the next one is from Ruben. And if you see, Ruben's from Scotland. And if you see his photo uh, on the cover, if you see him on you go to my Amazon site or to my website. He's on the cover of it in the far right bottom corner. And he's his story was really touching to me. And it goes a little something like this. I'm nine years old and I first noticed I had alopecia when I was eight years old and my eyebrows and hair started coming out. I would look into the mirror every morning before school and I just seems to have less and less hair. I asked my mom to check my bed pillow because I was worried that it might need washed and that was causing the hair to fall out. But as we started to look closely at my arms and legs, we noticed that all my hair was coming out, even my eyelashes. One morning, my mom noticed I was crying while looking into the mirror. 
she asked me what was wrong and I told her I was worried that even my teeth would fall out. We then decided it was time to see a specialized doctor who told us that I, ha- that I had alopecia. I was very upset, sad, and confused. I stopped wanting to go to school or my other activities like swimming, cubs, or football. I didn't like being with people I didn't know, especially older kids. I just wanted to hide and not go out. And I'm going to skip ahead in his story. Uh, <clears throat> says... As the weeks went on, my hair got to a stage that it was looking a mess because it was so thin. So my dad decided we should cut what was left off. He had an idea that we should have a bit of fun when we were doing it. We got one of my mom's friends, Kaylee, who does amazing body and head art, to paint my head after we had shaved it off. Mom and dad also let me have a sleepover party the night before. The friends I asked to stay over also asked if they could have their hair shaved off to help me feel better about it and not feel alone and isolated about my condition. So in the morning, after the sleepover, all five of us sat in a row in our kitchen and had our hair shaved off. It was great fun, and it made me feel confident that my friends also had to go into school feeling different. What an awesome support group. I love it. Yeah. It makes me cry. That's just- I know. It makes me feel emotional, too, when I heard that a little bit in the voice there. Um, my next one is Deirdre, and she is... She is a spitfire. She's an immigration lawyer in Miami, and I just absolutely love her. And her story starts off. So, let me see. I think I'll start here. I can distinctly remember screaming bloody murder at my sister, Aria, as she bent me over the tub and ruthlessly brush the matted knots out of my hair. I was probably about 10 years old and still remember crying from the pain like it was yesterday. Now at 37, who would have known then I would cry so many tears over my hair? Not from the pain of the knots being brushed out, but from the pain of not being there at all. I still feel that weird lump in my throat when I see old photos of myself with a full head of thick, crazy curls. And more often than when I look in the mirror, I see my head now completely bald but I don't cry anymore. Now I just wonder where did all that hair go? Was it possible that what was once so thick and unruly I could hardly fit into it? Each jaw clip is now completely non-existent. Why has my body chosen to attack itself in this cruel and bizarre way? There must be some larger reason fate has chosen me to walk this particular path. I know there are millions of people out there with alopecia who can relate all too well to these thoughts and emotions. Meanwhile, those who go about their daily lives never knowing the strange affliction can never seem to really relate. It is only hair, they say. At least we don't have cancer, they say. Oh, they are so clueless, even when they mean well. Most of the time, their words, even said with the best intentions, just hurt. So that's a piece of Deirdre's story. I think that's the most amazing way of talking about it with anything that we don't understand (laughs) we don't know what to say right people just don't know what to say and they say things that they don't realize is so hurtful I was just writing a piece before you and I started about a suicide situation and um, what how people that are survivors of that how they what they have to go through and and the reaction that people have and and the things people don't realize how cruel they're being <laughs> when they say things or don't say things, right? <laughs> Absolutely. When you don't say something, that's, that's also a piece of it. But how are we supposed to understand if we don't mm-hmm. kind of open up open up these conversations a little bit and, and we want them to, you know, people who are, are struck and touched by suicide, we all, of course, we want to, you know, give them our thoughts and our love yeah and yeah and without being without being uncomfortable for sure yeah. yeah but I think your work is so profound too for people that are struggling with something that is so very little known or understood that you're allowing the people in your book to their voices to be heard of all ages from everywhere yes so, so then maybe someday it won't be something that will feel like this for others in the future right. absolutely and that that's the point of it right you just want yeah. this kind of open dialogue for people to get to climb into our lives for a few pages and just see who we are and then walk out more educated and, and ready to 
yeah to ed- educate those around them too so that's a big piece of it do you do I have time to read a couple more absolutely please do these are fabulous oh, good so I have Andre who at the time was 10 years old when we wrote the story and I'm actually going to read his mom's story at that his mom is named Mimi, and I absolutely love this family. They are fantastic. Um, Andre started losing his hair three years ago in June. He had he had been sick with fevers and fatigue for the first part of the month. He underwent a workup for anemia, but everything was negative. I was worried that it was something more serious, so it was a huge sense of relief to find out he was okay. In July, I noticed a round patch of hair loss on top of his head as I was sunblocking him for the pool. Then he told me kids were asking why he didn't have eyebrows. Did he have eyebrows? That was a moment. I hadn't noticed they were gone. Within a week, he was off to sleep away camp with his sister. By the time he came home and I did my post-camp vice check, I saw that he had lost about a third of his hair. We quickly went back to the pediatrician and had an appointment with the dermatologist within a week. August. Alopecia. No lupus, thank God. Many treatment options were discussed, topical steroids, chemical irritants, injections. We started with the steroids. We ended with the steroids. This isn't working, and it's a waste of time, Andre stated. The wisdom of an eight-year-old is a remarkable thing. Andre was completely hairless by October. A fantastic barber, a wonderful dermatologist, and many friends supported us along the way. No, we aren't going to put a wig on a little boy. No, we aren't going to pursue injections or clinical trials. It's hair. It's not easy. It's not deadly either. As a parent, my emotions have run the gamut from despair to pride. I have watched my child hang his head. I've also watched him strut. Last year, he and his friend did a fundraiser for the Children's Alopecia Project at school. I love my son so much. I'm so proud of him. Alopecia doesn't get you good grades, sports, success, or popularity. It's not an excuse to skip the study time, slack off, or shy away. It has allowed for tremendous maturity, empathy, and emotional strength not typically accessed in childhood. We take it a day at a time. That is absolutely beautiful <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and very real from a mother's heart. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love this. I love Mimi. She's great. Let's see. So this um, next story is from Allison, and she's a friend of mine who's in the limelight a lot she's on tv a lot and i think i'll read from kind of the middle of her story it says let's see all right let me start back here actually i thought i knew where i wanted to start okay but i'm sorry it's okay um I was diagnosed with alopecia areata in a big city by a highly qualified physician who ran a multitude of tests. To this day, I can't remember what great shoes. I can remember what great shoes the doctor would wear. I could never look her in the eye, but always look forward to seeing her every four weeks. Strange as it may be, I would look forward to the appointments with her as she was smart, pretty, and had the best shoes. She asked me about my hair loss without ever giving me a strange look. Even those, those appointments would bring hundreds of shots to my head and usually some blood tests. I still loved her in those shoes. Those were my adolescent years. I spent my time playing with my brother after school and on weekends I did well in school and on weekends. I did well in school but never really liked or trusted my classmates. My hair came and went but I always looked like a hot mess. At the end of high school, my hair all came back. Not to miss a moment, I got a perm and a can of aqua and hairspray. My motto was as big as it could get, making sure every strand stood on end was my daily routine. All right. I love that. That's great. Yeah. And I will say, um, I'm going to jump a little bit in her story because she talks about her experience in television. Um, it says, when you enter the, the world of television, the gleam of camera lens or lighted set is both unfamiliar and exhilarating. You're suddenly center stage and away from your daily morning walk with a dog. You're in front of a waiting audience. I never intended to set foot in the entertainment industry, and now I find my, myself reflecting back on a career that has allowed me to record more hours of live television than Jay Leno, Conan O'Brien, and Rachel Ray combined. 
I never thought I would reach those numbers, especially while living with alopecia in the world where bad hair days cannot be hidden and trusted teleprompters are nowhere to be seen. When beginning my time as a, as a show host and television personality, I was forced to confront my alopecia before millions of viewers and conquer my own apprehensions about sharing my experiences with my audience. It only took about 15 years behind the camera. Yes, I just forwarded 15 years. Television was a game of chess with alopecia, dodging hairstylists and guests and spending hours in my home figuring which way to make my bangs go to cover up the spot. It was a daily struggle and it was exhausting. And so with Allison, I wanted her to talk about her experience about having regrowth because she has a significant amount of hair regrowth, which is something that we, we all battle with when we're in the alopecia areata stage, which is the roller coaster of growth and loss. Mm -hmm. um, and what she, I, I asked her to, to speak on that a little bit, and this is what she wrote. She said, over the years, some have told me that they were surprised about my having alopecia. We don't have the bad kind, they would say. I think some think that if you're if you have lot, not lost it all, it is not as bad. Well, I did lose it all. Some came back, and it continues to be a struggle to hold on to every strand. They also forget that all the symptoms on the inside are the same. It has always felt strange to be judged on what kind of alopecia is worse than another. They're all just as serious and challenging, and they all bring us together. Hmm. That's interesting that even in the community, you know, it's, well, you don't have the bad kind, but it's still right. a struggle. Totally. Yeah, we're still, there's still the stigma of hair loss and mm -hmm. what people think and, and draw conclusions about. So Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is, do I have a time? I have one more story, yes. um, just a short thing. Sure. And then, and then I'll end with my own. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Great. And so this is Dean, and he's a race car driver in Australia. And I will, I think I'll start with, I think I'll start at the beginning with him, and then skip around. It was a hot day, and when I ran some water through my hair, followed by rubbing my hands through it, they were covered with more hair than usual. I didn't say anything for a day or two to anyone, but when it didn't stop falling out, I consulted with mom. We followed up by going to see a specialist. When I was first diagnosed with alopecia by the dermatologist, he pretty much just said, you have alopecia. You can try steroid injections in the scalp. Otherwise, there isn't much else you can do. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I went home, the first thing I did was get on the internet and research more. My hair loss was so rapid that the hair on my head had totally disappeared within three weeks. And the remainder of my body hair took another two months from onset. From what I could find online, it was <laughs> what type of alopecia I had and that there was no clear treatment known to work. I had just started dating my now wife, Erin. She was my rock from the beginning. We were living in different states at the time and FaceTime wasn't around then. So a photo when I first started losing my hair made her realize what was happening. She came over when I lost all the hair on my head but still had my eyebrows and lashes. I started to lose confidence in myself and wasn't sure how she would react. She was nothing but supportive. I was told the most common cause of alopecia is stress. So of course, everyone kept asking, are you stressed? Everyone has stress in their lives. But I personally don't believe it was stress related. While I was going through the period, through the period of not knowing whether my hair would grow back or not, I was still in my first year of V8 super car racing. As a full-time driver, I wasn't sure how to deal with my condition to the public. So I tried to hide it for a while by saying I shaved my head to raise funds for charity. My results in racing began to show my loss in confidence. Once all my hair was completely gone, it was harder to hide the truth any longer. I then opted for a professional wig. The wig really did nothing for my confidence, and I didn't want to hide behind it. I soon made the decision to stop wearing it and embrace my appearance. After I stopped worrying about what others thought and concentrated on my job, my results in confidence improved. The only issue with not having hair in the race car was that sweat would not get caught by my eyebrows and would sometimes strip straight into my eye. Other than that, it had no other effects. <clears throat> That's great. Yeah, it gives you a little bit of perspective about how men also really feel it. Um, 
that that's a big part of what I write about in the book that I try to focus on, that it's not easier uh, for men or boys. Certainly they have the same ideas about themselves and what's expected. Mm -hmm. And, and when you're getting these uh, comments like, Oh, you're a man, at least you're a boy. It's not a big deal. Um, Those are, those are powerful statements that, that affect you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. And I'll just kind of start in the middle of my story, too. Excuse me. Discovery. Ask anyone with alopecia, and they will tell you their moment of discovery. It may have been a hairdresser, a friend standing above them, or like me, my mother found it. I can still remember. I can still hear her soft intake of of breath as she combs my hair after a bedtime bath. I'm only seven years old, and although I'm not all that intuitive, I still feel her concern. I turn to look at her and notice she's put her hand to her mouth, trying to quiet her gasp. I ask what's wrong until she finally gives in and wordlessly and gently places my fingers on a small bald spot toward the right side of my head. We rub the condensation off the mirror, and I awkwardly crane my head to try and see it. Now that I know it's there, it's easy to find. That spot feels clammy and strange, not like the same soft feel of skin on my arm or neck. My mom tries to reassure me that it's nothing, and I believe her. We quietly get ready for bed, not giving much energy to this newfound thing. I'm not worried as I drift off to sleep. One of us sleeps well that night. My seven-year-old self is unaware that my parents stay awake, quietly talking long into the night. Their questions go unanswered. There is no internet to tell them what it is. Will it go away? Will it get bigger? There are just too many questions and no immediate answers. Diagnosis. The next thing I remember is being in a doctor's office. He tells us there's a name for it. It's called alopecia areata. Is there a cure, my mother asks. He shrugs his shoulders. No, not really. But take this cream home and put it on her head several times a day to try to stimulate hair growth. I look intently at the doctor as he gives me this big diagnosis. And all I remember thinking is, wow, this guy is really orange. His complexion is an unnatural shade of orange. The white of his doctor's coat is so stark in contrast to his orange face. Carrots. Maybe he eats too many carrots. I can't stop staring. So orange. Keeps repeating over and over in my mind as I look at him. Little did I know that my earnest curiosity about him has given me a glimpse of what I would soon experience for the rest of my life. Adults, children, family members, and strangers would stare at me and wonder, was I contagious? Was I dying? Was I in pain? Did I have cancer? And that's it. That's it. Amazing. Well, Deanna, I'm so grateful that you came on the podcast first. And I'm very, very grateful that you have collected these stories and put them together. And um, you're getting it out into the world to share because my own personal experience was, you know, it wasn't major, but it was enough that I really understand some of what you're reading, you know, the you know, you hide it and you don't want anybody to know. And, you know, you try to figure out what's going on and there's a little bit of dismissiveness towards it. And so, Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for being here. One other thing I wanted to mention too, for my listeners that um, besides getting this book and sharing this with other people, um, you have, or do you run a camp for children? Is that what I saw on your Facebook or you're part of an organization that does that? And if so, share it with us a little bit about that. Uh, Yeah. So I, I work with the children's alopecia project and they're a wonderful nonprofit that works on the confidence boosting of children with alopecia. And so I help, I, I just help run a camp in California right now. I just, as a volunteer and a mentor, and that just, it brings me a lot of satisfaction in life to know that I can help kids where exactly I was when I was seven years old. And I really could have used that. And, and so I, I encourage people to, you know, if they're in a position to donate to this great cause, it's, it's all reachable children's alopecia project and they provide camp 
for free to any child with alopecia. So oh, that's so fantastic. Yeah, they are fantastic. So. That's awesome. So listeners, listen up. If you have something you really feel like you want to donate to, it sounds like a fantastic project to do so. Mm-hmm. And um, reach out, get Deanna's book, um, find her on Facebook and, and um, through and find out more about this and share it with others because I think the more that people learn about it, it'll be easier for future generations coming up with it. And absolutely. And so thank you so much for being on the show, Deanna. And when you get your um, other book work done, let me know. We'll have you back on and we'll share that too. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me, Vicki. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We hoped you loved hearing from the author as much as we did. If you did enjoy the author, make sure you find them on social media, buy their book and write a review. Are you a published author and would like to be featured on the podcast? Visit us at our website to learn more. You can help support the production of this podcast by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Share the podcast with your friends. And most importantly, become a supporter. Supporters receive monthly bonus podcasts and a newsletter filled with tips from our authors. To find out more how to become a supporter, visit our website. And finally, I hope you always remember to enjoy the journey. Until next week, this is Vicki J. Carter saying goodbye.